USMNT with only MLS-based players beats El Salvador 6-0. But it's El Salvador's B team and they haven't played together in about a year. How much does this game actually mean? Well, it probably means a little bit more than you think. Let's discuss. We'd like to welcome back to the channel after a long hiatus, Adam Record, of course. If you've been a long time viewer of the channel, you know who Adam is. He's the guy that that uh, I always get to whoop when we do NCAA 2K. <laughs> so it's it's <laughs> I'm glad to have him here to talk about some soccer. Dang, what one intro that is right there. So I'm, I'm glad we're back in a realm that I'm a little bit more familiar with than uh, <laughs> get my butt handed to me on uh, <laughs> doing some basketball. So <laughs> all right, no fair words. enough. Well. Well, uh, let's let's start kind of general, and then we, we can talk specifics. But you know, there's normally in a in a six nil game, you have a whole lot to talk about. But I feel like this time we have even more, just given you know what team we saw on the field for the U.S., who we saw them playing. Uh, what are your general thoughts on on what we've seen with this six nil victory? Yeah, um, I'm, where to start? I think it honestly, to me. It was a little bit lackluster. I think, you know, the five goals and what was that, like 10 minute span or something like that was awesome. Yeah, five you goals know? in 10 minutes. Yeah, that was fantastic to see. You know, we great. We got the goals. We beat the team that we should be. You know, awesome. Great. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. going forward, I mean, they, they made some subs. They made subs in the 35th minute, I want to say. Um, I believe they, yeah, they made like a defense. They took a, an attacker off for a, def a defender, I believe then and kind of like mm -hmm. compact their shape a little bit and this has been the problem of usa teams is beating a defensive team or a defensive shaped team you know and i shouldn't even say usa yeah. teams it because the the way we, i i define the two rosters that we had is the last one against panama and wales was the euro boys and then this one was kind of the mls camp and so i mean just yep. i mean obviously and the euro boys european soccer that that's they're taught like they are coached to break down defensive shapes because when you have a better team yeah. against a worse team that's what they're coached that's why the european team was able to break down panama like they did wales was obviously a little bit tougher whereas the mls team once el salvador went back into that shape you know it we kind of didn't really look like we were getting shots we were making good plays still we just didn't look like scoring goals you know, and I don't, I want to say, I don't think we took our foot off the gas until maybe late on in the game. So I think, I think that's a, a perspective to look at. I know I just kind of rambled on there about it, but I think like my first takeaway is we're still going to have issues with some of these players and breaking down teams. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that is, that is a point of view that I had not really considered before. I think I was kind of looking more superficially looking at the goal tallies and, and looking at uh, what was important to me was to see how much of an athletic advantage that the U.S. had over El Salvador mm -hmm. the whole time. And that's something that I have continued to notice both from the Euro boys and from the MLS camp is that there's there continues to be an athletic advantage. And it's now we're now firmly into the into the point where you're saying Basically, any team the U.S. goes against, you can bet that the U.S. is going to have superior athletes. The question is, you know, how do they how do they perform as soccer players beyond yeah. just just athletes? Um, and I, I I think that that part is good. I do want to talk about kind of the tactical approach. I think it's a good thing if a national team coach or a club coach, for that matter, kind of enforces the same uh, the the same tactical approach to all of his matches, any of the players that he has uh, when it comes to, you know, from the from the senior squad down. And when you look at this, you can kind of say, uh, you know, forgive me for using a bit of a labored metaphor, but but you can kind of say that the Euro boys are like the USMNT senior squad. Like among those guys are the 11 best players that the US can put out on the field at any given time. And now you have the MLS team, which are gonna be the rest of the guys that fill in for injuries, guys that come off the bench. So guys that are still important, and we'll get around to how important these guys really are in a little bit. But I do wanna ask, it seemed to me that the tactics are, are very similar. Um, 
but when you translate them to this squad as opposed to all of the European players that we saw last month, do you think that it's something that these MLS guys can learn? Do you think they they excelled within it? I mean, I thought there were times where they looked great, but but what what were your thoughts on the tactical approach? Yeah, tactically speaking, I think I think what Burhalter's plan was to get and I was going to touch on this a little bit later, but I might as well open it up now because it fits in. But um, And I had to ask you before game, I think it was Taylor Twelman that said this, but um, he mentioned that you need 30 to 40 players going into a World Cup cycle, you know? And so the, the, these past few camps, this past year, was Burhalter working with 30 to 40 players, maybe not that many, but a good amount of players, definitely at least 30, that... Mm-hmm you know, will be used in our World Cup cycle. All have now played on the field and as a sub, Mm -hmm. as a starter, and have gotten valuable minutes in this system. Doesn't, I mean, does you can, the opponent's the opponent, whatever, but they've played in the system and they have both executed this system. You know, Mm -hmm. not one personally more effectively than the other, but I mentioned this to you at the halftime of the game today, like, they were doing very like this the MLS camp today was doing very simple things that would not break down a Wales team as given yeah. our nil-nil draw with our European team, you know. But right, right. I think the slight twist that people aren't seeing is that because some of these ML MLS players are playing maybe a little too simple, doing, you know, they're just going through the motions a little bit because they know El over tough through ball can be El Salvador, you know. I think yeah. that maybe something like that, like just a different thought process, actually could have helped maybe the European players break down Wales. If you get what I'm saying, which is why yeah. So I th- so you're kind of coming at it from the perspective of saying that the U.S. should almost lean into the fact that that they will always put a caliber athletes on the field and and they should kind of use that as opposed to going into it thinking we're going to tactically break down every team that we come across totally and i think i think we will to be better teams we will need to tactically break them down you know i think that's going to be a part of it but i think going back to your original point how burhalter's instilling a system wide fullbacks you know attacking center mids right. one defensive mid you know, wide players pinch in at times. They go wide. You know, it just depends on what side the ball. You know, it, you know all the little things yeah. that that go into an 11 v 11 soccer game, tactically speaking. But I think that now everyone has a taste of it. I think it's now going to come down to who can execute and who can make the best decision at the right time. Whether it comes from someone mm-hmm. playing in MLS or European. When it comes to these European qualifiers, when we get a mix, when we get, can see our best team together you know hopefully we will see that yeah i I think these these games like this game today yes it was six nil it probably should have been you know 15 nothing realistically no offense (laughs) to el salvador but like i i really think we should have put away i think we had 22 shots in the game and we should have put away i mean we only had eight on target and if we have eight on target we scored six you know that's a good ratio there i think we should have had better quality shots personally but again you get better player quality i think we get a little bit more i don't know i think it's good to see him in the system and i think bro halter saw a lot of improvement i think someone i'm really yeah. impressed with i'll just jump right into this here but someone i'm really impressed with was sam vines at left back we i ha- figured you were gonna bring him up yep yeah and we have i think we have a good left back from europe that plays for fulham in the premier league which is awesome and anthony robinson I think we have maybe a little bit more of a complete, less athletic fullback in Sam Vines. Someone that has a little bit more technical ability. It's hard to say, you know, because Sam Vines has not competed at the Premier League level, you know? But I think what we saw tonight, Sam Vines in the system, I think Sam Vines in the system was better than Serginho Dest at left back, personally. Just because he's he's left-footed, he knows yeah. how it's well, and for the Colorado Rapids, he's played in a formation where he's kind of had to act as a wing back, and he's played mm-hmm. in, a, in a formation where they've had a four back, but he's been in the attacking fullback, and he's gotten goals and assists. So yeah. I think he's kind of suited for Burhalter's game, and I think that's the whole point of it's not really a, a European versus MLS roster thing. It should be yeah. who's performing best in these positions. I think that's what Burhalter's done 
with these, we only have three camps this year, three or four camps this year, but in these right. three or four camps, that's what he's done is he's evaluate, evaluate players based on that. So that come March 2021, when it's go time, he can go then based off performance, you know, and I think, yeah. I'm not, I, I, honestly, off the top of my head, I'm not entirely too sure when MLS season's game started again. It might be in that March time frame, so I don't know how many MLS players we will have available i really haven't looked that far ahead um but you know somebody like sam vines could be in the mix there and i wouldn't be surprised yeah i mean i i absolutely see where you're coming from and i think it's interesting that now that we've seen in very quick succession we've seen the european squad get out there and we've seen the mls squad get out there and i think what burhalter is asking the team to do from a tactical perspective, is a little bit more similar to what you would see in Europe as opposed to the MLS. It's it's a little bit more strenuous in terms of, you know, where your mind has to be, how far ahead you have to be thinking, which is all great stuff. I mean, I love that. And so I think, you know, to your point, where we'll stop seeing come competitive games a divide between MLS and Europe, I think we'll see the European players and like we said most of you would think that the US's top 11 that they can put out there are probably all European but then what's going to get mixed in is the MLS players that are capable of of functioning in that same system and Mm -hmm. I think Sam Vines is a great example I think ironically Sebastian Legette who both of us criticized a lot for his performance against Wales because he was put at striker where he is not natural. He looked a lot better here in a, in a position where he is yes. more natural, and it makes you think that's that's much better depth at midfield. I, I don't want to see him at striker again, but I do want to <laughs> see him do what he was doing uh, in the midfield. Christopher, Christopher Mueller is another guy who I thought played really, really well. Like Different guys from the MLS level that can integrate into this more kind of European tactical focus system. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that your 100% spot, and Sebastian Leggett is another another guy that I was going to touch on as well. There, um, getting to your point, you you know, it's it's interesting. And there's Burhalter every single time. If you look at the Wales game, if you look at um, Panama, if you look at the El Salvador, you look at three games. Each each setup was the same. It was they pretty much a, a 4-3-3. You know, yep. but like today, for example, the, the difference in this 4-3-3 was he was playing Brendan Aronson, who's an attacking midfielder for the Philadelphia Union, you know, who had, I think, created 33 chances for them this year and has eight assists off that. And he's a young player going yep. to Europe next year. That's great. He also played another yep, over to RB Salzburg. Yes, I believe in January. Yes, which is, you know, awesome for him. And I think he could be allowed to make the um, Champions League roster because they can add three new players. So that would be great for him. Yep. Um, yep. Sebastian Legette is another attacking midfield player. And what we saw in the last game with Panama um, was McKenney, who's more of a box to box. In my in my opinion, I, I think he's more of a box to box. Schalke, before he moved to Juventus, he was more of a, a defensive mid, box to box. In my opinion, he definitely played deeper. But yeah, that that was the difference. Was we had a little, we had a slightly different midfield setup. And so my point is, we pushed two higher players, two guys that I, I bet Burhalter just said, go out there and create, and I, that's what they did. Yeah. They both scored a goal, and they both created. You know. And so yep. I think both of them we will see come March because they did what they were asked to do, you know. So I, you're absolutely yep, right. Absolutely. I'm just backing I'm backing up your point here is I agree with everything you said. I think there's players that have looked to, you know, fill the part here. So. Yeah, so to kind of to, to go off from that, because you touched on different guys that we will see come March, come more competitive games, uh, beyond just Aronson and Leggett, and I agree with with – both of your points there. I think these are two guys that that we will see on the on a final 23-man roster for competitive matches. Uh, but beyond just those two, who else caught your eye that you think this is a guy who uh, will at the very least provide depth on that 23-man roster, or you know potentially slot in uh, as somebody who can actually bring some meaningful minutes to the team? Uh, absolutely. I, you know, it's hard to say outside of 
you know, Sam Vines maybe on the de- – just thinking defensive side. I don't think any of the goalies will yeah. see maybe Bill Hamid as, like, a third option, as, like, a veteran yeah. presence, you know, third option. Maybe yeah. I don't think. Well, I, I, think, I think Zach Steffen getting his first cap in the Champions League yeah. pretty much signifies that – that Man City believes that that he is at least a keeper worthy of Champions League minutes, even if they're not uh, in a true competitive sense, because City had already had already clinched a spot in the knockout mm-hmm. rounds. But he's still there. I think Zach Steffen's going to be the number one going forward for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And just on that, I, the U.S. just breeds goalkeepers in a way. You know, like <laughs> yeah, like, you're definitely right about like that. Like we really do. Like we've always had. Like Tim Howard was playing for Everton and Manchester United. You know, yep. now we have Zach Steffen, who is a backup at Man City, but being a backup to Ederson, I mean, hey. Right. You're cool. talking about backing up a top five keeper on earth. Yeah. You know, there's there's not many good. There's not many national teams that boast a number one that would start over Ederson. And yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think goalkeepers, I'm just going to take that step aside. If you're a goalkeeper listening to this podcast or <laughs> this episode, you know, whatever, wherever this is going, you know, it, it, you're listening mm-hmm. to this. I'm sorry. I'm not going to touch on that. But I think for field players, um, Julian Arahu, I believe. Ara- mm-hmm. Did I say that right? I think so. I always. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Arahu is how you pronounce it. Okay, Arahu. Um, I think you know he could get his name in the mix. I didn't think he'd do that. C- center backs. I mean, he. I mean, actually, uh, I missed. But he actually had one bad pass where he passed it mm-hmm. straight to an El Salvador player. I guarantee you, I don't think he'll ever do that again. <laughs> he's, a, he's a smart enough player that he will never do that again. I don't think I've ever seen him do that for the LA Galaxy. So, mm-hmm. you know, he could get, he had played solid tonight. You know, he could yep. have his name in the yep. list. Mark McKenzie, I'm very high on personally. Aaron Long, I think, is solid. I mean, I'd love to see them challenged a bit more, so I can't really. I think they'll be around the pool and whatnot later on. I don't know if they'll be yeah. there for qualifying, but we'll see. Sam Vines, I've already touched. I think, I think Aaron Long probably has a chance to be just because he, he captained this team tonight. He's a veteran. He's been around sure. many U.S. camps for a long time. So you almost feel like for the depth of... And the veteran leadership alone, he would be on that first competitive team, you know, when it comes to March or April. Whether he continues to be is, of course, we don't know. We'll have to see how he does. Yeah, exactly. So it, he's he's there. there. I think he's in the mix. I think Mark McKenzie's in the mix. Sam Vines, I already touched on. I said he's in the mix. Jackson Ewell, yep. that's an interesting one for me. I think he's got a really nice passing range ability from what I've seen when he's been at San Jose um, earthquakes. I, I mean, if we have Tyler Adams healthy, it's. It, I mean, it's no yeah. question. Obviously, it, it's it's curtains for everyone else. So. Absolutely, and that's what I that's what I was going to bring up. You know, it's almost like it's the same thing that we touched on with the goalkeepers. When you have a position that is specific and is very important to the way that the team functions, the same way that Zach Steffen has locked up the number one and no one's going to be able to pass him. I think for a long time. I think it's the exact same with that number six position, the same Tyler Adams. I don't think anyone from the U.S. is unseating him there. Current, currently, I agree with that, yeah. We haven't seen someone come in that's able to do it. But, you know, and even then, I think Jackson Ewell, um, you know, he, he could be in the mix. I think Brendan Aronson, I've already touched on, he's going to be in the mix. Sebastian Leggett as well. Paul Ariola, I'm going to save. I'm just reading through the <laughs> the starting lineup right now. <laughs> Io Akinola, you know, he, he didn't do anything else to set himself apart from Sebastian Soto um, from, yep. from the other game. Oh, who, am I, who am I forgetting was the other striker? Um, oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, Josh Sargent's still kicking around, but you're... Josh Sargent. Who, st- who started the Panama game? Why am I forgetting um, who started Panama? Well, now I'm forgetting too. Oh my gosh! <laughs> this, the the fact that we can't remember the exact name of the striker is is I, good. You know, it's because crazy. We're looking at a lot of depth in that position for the U.S., which we have not had, which we we've not seen for a little I while. Can, I can literally picture him, and I am I'm blanking on his name. I'm literally blanking on his name right now. Oh, Giacchini. Yeah, yeah, Nicholas Giacchini. Giacchini. I, I love that kid. I think that kid. I think that kid's gonna be better than Sergeant personally. But, mm-hmm. but uh, yes, him, he, Nico. He's gonna be. He, he's awesome. I don't think Io Akinola did anything different from them. Chris Mueller. 
I think that's an interesting one. I think, obviously, Wilson's left wing got that pretty locked up. I actually think Chris Mueller, if he can, you know, stay healthy, I think he could make it as kind of like Jordan Morris, you know, a difference maker, pacey off the bench, creative yeah. guy that could get in behind teams. He could be on yeah. this radar for 2022. So Well, that's a great that's a great comparison as well. I mean, if if you remember back to the Gold Cup, Jordan Morris made the difference on more than one occasion by just doing exactly that, whether it was whether it was Pulisic who, you know, was getting locked down or I think one game he was like he was sick or something mm-hmm. and so he wasn't making a big impact or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be, you bring Jordan Morris in almost as like a pinch hitter almost, just a guy that can inject a little bit more energy uh, and, and a look that the other team will not have seen. And I, I think that's a great comparison for the way that Mueller looked tonight. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, he was, he was fantastic in my eyes. Um, probably one of the better U.S. players in terms of ratings I would have given to play tonight and then we're going to come down to Paul Ariola just to round up the starting 11 and I've never been high on Paul Ariola. you know he's I haven't either he's a I think I mean obviously he's a professional soccer player in the U.S. Um, so he's good to some extent <laughs> I think he's athletic I actually don't yep. think he's tactically all there all the time I if, definitely agree with that. And if he's listening to this, or if someone that knows him is listening to this, it's... I'm sorry, it's nothing personal. I don't know the guy. I'm just saying what I'm <laughs> seeing, where his decision-making is a bit out whack. Tonight, I'll give him an exception, and tonight, I actually congratulate him, because he it's his first game back since February, and he scored right, a goal. Right, when he... Uh, he tore his ACL back in February, mm-hmm. and so he was able to return, score on his return. Yeah, absolutely. It's Fantastic. Good great. for him. It's a great story. Yeah, big, big win for him. Big win for the team. So good for him. He could prove me wrong, you know, moving forward. But yeah. from what I've seen of past Ariola is he can't cut it. I, th- I would. There's 15 other wingers I would take over him, you know. So... Yeah, maybe no, not think, that many. Maybe not that many, but there's definitely guys I would take over him that are maybe just a little bit more pacey or have or maybe a little bit more tactical sense. Yeah. And the one thing he does that irks me beyond belief, and I'll just a little tip out there to everyone, is when he's got a guy one on one on the wing and he's standing him up. Ariola always plays a ball, and sometimes this works. Not all the time. It majority of the time, statistically speaking, this is one of the least percentage crosses you can put into the box. Is a cross where he puts it curling away because he's right footed. So we're saying he's on the right wing, right footed, curling away yep. from the goal, pat behind the penalty spot. You're like heading yeah. towards 18. That's one of the worst balls you can play in soccer, statistically speaking. Mm-hmm. And he does that like seven out of ten of his crosses. Watch it. Go back tonight and watch the game. He killed three or four chances that we probably could have had, like, maybe two more goals from. Seriously. And it's super critical. And, again, he just came back. So, you know, maybe he's working on it or whatever. But that's been my criticism of him the past, like, two, three years. Mm -hmm. So. Well, and I think think it really speaks to the growth of the USMNT just over the last year and a half or so. Because at one time where Areola, you're thinking – oh god this is going to be the guy that that they're going to have to roll with on the wing well now suddenly here comes Gio Reyna who has a, a complete a full toolbox of skills and if the cross isn't there he's got a hundred different things that he can do his versatility uh among other things and, and it's not just Reyna I'm just saying you know Reyna plays in that same position so uh, I think that's it's it's a lot different. We're, th- we're thinking of a lot different setup here than we were looking at, you know, maybe last Gold Cup or, or something where you need a lot more of Areola. Mm-hmm. Where now, now you're looking at him and saying, at this point, he's going to be fighting to even get on a team, which I think is a is a good thing overall. I mean, yes, it, absolutely. It, I would feel bad for Areola if he's if he's cut, you know, from a competitive roster. But for the USMNT as a whole to see a guy go from starting 11 to not making the team in about 18 months would be great and that brings me to the final thing that I want to talk about when when it comes to let's say let's say 2022 let's talk about a world cup you know forget forget gold cup and, and everything else let's talk world cup when it comes to 2022 how many of the 23 guys do you think or you can give me a range how many do you think will be MLS players or guys that 
played professionally for MLS teams that then went to Europe? Three. I could see at least eight. Eight or nine. Mm -hmm. Which sounds so like thinking, a lot. You're thinking sounds about like a third of the team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I actually... I think I think that's good. I think it's good overall. Um, you want to see... I mean, obviously you want to see the U.S. put the best team out there that they possibly can to win matches and compete for World Cup championships. But I think the more that they can integrate MLS players, you know, we've talked about this so many times before, the growth of MLS and the USMNT, they are linked. I mean, they're, they're, you, you, can't, you can't have one without the other in a way. I mean, you... The growth of one will lead to the growth of the other, and mm -hmm. when they're both good, both of them excel. And I think as American soccer fans, it's easy to forget we want the MLS to be a top league. I mean, that's if we want the USMNT to be a top team, if we want the US to be a top nation, we need the MLS to be a top league. And having, as you say, a third of your team that hopefully in 2022 will be at least competing, you know, a force to be reckoned with in the in the knockout stages of the World Cup. Mm -hmm. That to me is only good news. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, well, I hope uh, I hope that's exactly what we will see going forward. And and like you said, I mean, we will see some some competitive matches uh, in just a few months. So not not too long from now, we'll get to see hopefully uh, a better view of what Burhalter thinks his best team is going to look like and if it is 11 Europeans then great um, if it's maybe if it's you know nine Europeans and two MLS guys even better in my opinion if those are the best 11 guys that'll win games um, I think uh, I think if there's any MLS players among them that is good news that's a great sign absolutely I think the the more I mean I think it was it was clear, and again, it's no offense to to anyone that's listening to this podcast that may know someone playing in MLS, as you know, I do. Griffin does, you know, as we know, or somebody that knows somebody that's playing in Europe too. But like, I th I think we saw the difference in quality of teams from yeah. the MLS to the European rosters. I think that no matter the opponent, just in the in the passes players did, I, the, the little things, you know, that if. You know right. soccer, you see the little things, and you see the differences that these players are doing. So you see that. You mm -hmm. see that the Euro team was just that much cleaner. First touch, yep. passing. Again, no disrespect to the players in the MLS, but that's not to say that there weren't players out there tonight that were doing those things, you know? So, it, yeah. you yeah. know, you shouldn't. we shouldn't group them together like we are doing, but, you know, here we are, which is why it's I think... Which it's an easy distinction we'll to draw. That's that's yeah. the only reason that we do it. Yes. Because Burhalter himself did it. I mean, this is this isn't just us you sure. know, saying if you're if you're in the MLS, you're automatically worse than the Europeans. The the reason that this is happening is because the MLS was still in season. MLS was still in season when when uh, the Europeans were getting called for the friendlies last month, and now the European guys are in season. MLS is pretty much done, mm -hmm. uh, except for four teams, so they get their friendly. So that that's where the distinction comes from. It's not us saying necessarily if you're from if you're from MLS, you're going to be worse than all every single player that plays in Europe. Yep, yep. And just to wrap up as a final final point here, I don't know if you have anything else, but I guess my final point just about the difference about tonight as well is there are good players in the MLS that, I mean, there is a huge discrepancy that, the M discrepancy that the MLS is, you know, trash, not good, whatever. Well, we have a player like Brendan Aronson. Granted, he's 18, he's fresh, he's coming out, like, he's a young prospect, I get it, going and playing at Salzburg, yep. as we mentioned earlier, you know, but he's coming from MLS, and I think he, we will have more of that, and honestly, that's not a bad thing initially, because... Germany, before they turned into this world powerhouse that a lot of us know today, that's what they did with their program, is their best players, or some of their players for the national team, were not playing in the Bundesliga. They were playing in the right. Premier League, in Syria, in um, 
Spain. 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 Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they they did that, and they did that for like five, six years. And once they got good, they came back to Bayern Munich, where now Bayern Munich has a ton of really good Germans, you know? Yep. So, yep. I and think... And now, that, now that's starting to spread. And now yes. you're seeing, you know, half of the Bundesliga, if not more, is supplying players that will end up playing for the German national team and end up excelling for the German national team. There's a reason why Germany is consistently in the top three to five nations uh, in terms of projected. They don't always play like that, but they're respected as one of the top nations in the world. Yes, absolutely. And I think and I think that that will go to show at some point. I think, you know, 2022, there's going to be a lot of hype. And there should be. I think we should make it 2022, no questions asked. And there will be a lot of hype that we've made it back, you know. I think that's going to be awesome. But yeah. I would almost wait till 2026 before, you know, we really <laughs> get on the get That's on the kind of what train. I've been think, saying as well. I think 2022 is going to be a great experience. I actually think if we make it, we'll do worse than we did under Klinsman when we made that run against Belgium. And I, Was mm-hmm. that round of 16? That wasn't, we didn't even go Round of 16, far. yeah. Yeah, round of 16. I, so we just made it out of the group stage and we lost the next game. I think we'll just, I think, well, actually, we'll probably do the same. We'll make it out of the group stage and lose in round of 16, and everyone's going to be like, oh, failure. I wouldn't say that. I would say that's another World Cup under our belt. I'm sure we'll get some team, I don't know, we'll probably get France or something. You know, we'll get we'll get some <laughs> top five nation, you know, and we'll get, we'll get served a little. It, you know we bring it back in mm-hmm. we go again 2026 on our own turf i think that'd be awesome to win a world cup on our own turf and that's getting way ahead of myself but there's no better momentum there's no better time when all these young guys that we're talking about are going to hit their peak on our home turf yeah the country they're playing for yep. hey yep hey i'm just saying so no that's i i it, absolutely agree i absolutely agree it's i'm not saying it's going to happen but it's going to be much more exciting, I think, than tw- than the hype, the overhype of 2022. You know, and maybe I'm wrong about 2022. Great, I'm, I'd be happy to be wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so, but so so we'll in, a, in a in a general sense, what you're saying is is temper the expectations for 2022. Expect that we will see a really really solid team out there, but a team that will have teenagers, a team that will have guys that have very little experience on the top level. And so, you know, go in with the requisite expectations, knowing that that's the team you're getting. And then in 2026, all of these players are hitting their primes right at that time. You got a World Mm -hmm. Cup at home. That's the one where you're thinking World Cup or bust almost. That's the one where you're thinking this is the time that we can win a championship. A hundred percent. And there's nations like that have done that, like nations like us that have done that before, like Belgium. They've always produced very good soccer players, but they had they had their golden era per se. They they always right. have a solid team, but they never have a team that can go far. But just because it was their golden era doesn't mean that they're gonna win, you know? Yeah. Because they didn't yeah. they didn't win. But the expectations but- the expectations certainly for Belgium going into I would say I would say it's the same thing as the US where you're gonna see probably two World Cups that that encompass that mm-hmm. that golden era of players. So the expectations going into both 2014 and 2018 for Belgium was that they would be able to uh, potentially win the whole thing. And in both instances, I believe they made it to the semifinals and they lost both times, if I remember correctly. I think so. I think you are correct about that. Yeah. So so in a general sense, you know, this is this is kind of advice for any sports fan out there, not just of the USMNT. Mm-hmm. Understand that when in a, in a playoff scenario, in a knockout scenario, one game, anything can happen no matter how good that team is that you've put out on the field. So, you know, it's important It's important to, to say, on the one hand, you need to expect, and, and I think by 2026, we as U.S. fans need to expect a high level of performance, a, a World Cup winning level of performance from the U.S. men's national team, but also the world hasn't ended if something happens and they lose in the semifinals or whatever the case may be, because that's that's the nature of sports. That's why they play the game. Yes, hundred percent. I'm. Yep, I can. I'm on, I'm on board with that. with that. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to talk more U.S. soccer between now and 2026. So there will be a lot. There will be a lot more to say, I think, and and hopefully we can do this again 
in March with more competitive games where we get to see, uh, uh, we get a better look at who Greg Berhalter thinks is going to be his best 11. I'm, yeah, I'm down. I'm with it. And it's it's an exciting time, you know, to be a fan of the U.S. men's national team. Um, just, you know, what's going on in Europe, just what's happening yep. in the MLS, you know. It's, you know, it's an exciting time. Things are growing. Things are happening. Um, we just got to ride it at this point. Ride the wave. So. <laughs> yep, I, I agree with you. This is probably the best time since the 30s to be to be a, a U.S. soccer fan. So <laughs> I'm glad that we're I'm glad that we're living through it. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll have you back in March. We can talk more about it. Yeah, sounds great with me. As always, I appreciate you having me, doing big things on the channel, so keep it up. If, if you all are listening right now, like and subscribe. Big content from this guy here, from Mr. Griffin. So, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> hey, thanks thanks for doing my pitch for me. I appreciate that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like Adam said, like and subscribe. Let us know. Uh, obviously, you know, we always, we always love the conversation in the comments, so please drop a comment if you have one. Uh, There's a lot to talk about here for sure. So thank you all for listening. Subscribe. We appreciate you.